All right, everybody, today we're going to pick up and do our final uh, lecture about the World War I period in world history. Um, so this is day four of uh, your notes. Day one focused on the causes of the war. Day two is about the type of warfare with trench warfare and the new weapons. Day three is about how the war finally comes to a conclusion with the um, stalemate and the reduction of total war, the United States entering the war, and Russia leaving the war during the Russian Revolution. Um, and ultimately, the, uh, the notes ended yesterday with the discussion on what is known as the um, armistice that was signed at the end of the war. Okay, So it's really important to note, this is of paramount importance if you want to understand the developments of world history in the 20th century, particularly things that are going to lead up to World War II, which is going to forever change the course of world history, um, even to this very day. When World War I concluded, the central powers of Germany, Austria, Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and Bulgaria agreed with the Allies, particularly Britain, France, uh, the United States, and Italy, to what's known as an armistice. And by definition, an armistice is not a surrender. It is an agreement, mutual, meaning both sides mutually agree to end the hostilities and the fighting. So that's what happens at the end of the war, and that's what happens on November the 11th, 1918, signaling the end of World War I. However, what takes place in the following months is going to reshape the history of the world because the Allies, most notably the United States, Britain, and France, are going to hold a peace conference in Paris. It's going to be called the Paris Peace Conference. And out of this peace conference is going to come the treaty that is going to be the sort of um, treaty that shapes what happens at the end of the war. But what's very important to note is that the treaty and at the Paris Peace Conference, none of the central powers are allowed to have representation, which means Germany and Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire, they are not allowed to have people that are arguing about what should happen at the end of the war and how they should be reshaping the peace agreement at the end. So what comes out of the Paris Peace Conference is going to be called the Treaty of Versailles. Now you've heard Versailles before and you've seen this palace before in my class because this is the palace that was built by the absolute monarch of France, King Louis XIV. And ultimately, this is the palace in which the um, king, King Louis XVI, and his wife Marie Antoinette are residing when the French Revolution occurs. So this is where the treaty is going to be negotiated and signed by these gentlemen here. We're going to talk about them. So essentially what happens is, when the war ends and the Paris Peace Conference begins, there are three key uh, leaders that are going to negotiate the treaty. I call them the big three. I refer to them as the big three. There were other people involved, but these three are the ones that were the most influential and had the ideas that are going to most be implemented into the Treaty of Versailles. And the thing is, each of them has their own goals and ambitions and vision for what they want to see happen when they arrive in Paris in the early part of 1919. So here they are. Person number one is Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson is the president of the United States at that time, and I give him a nickname to help remember what he called for. He was known as the peacemaker. What Woodrow Wilson wanted was what he called a lasting peace. His goal in Paris was to come out of there with a treaty that would ensure a peace between the European countries that would last for centuries into the future. He had what was called his 14 points. All these different ideas, 14 different ideas of what should happen to ensure that lasting peace. Now, of the 14 ideas, the one that to him is most important is a creation of an international body of representatives from different countries that could discuss world issues before they, be go, before they go to war over them. And he says, we will call this the League of Nations. So Woodrow Wilson is number one. He's there trying to make peace amongst everybody. Number two is Lloyd George. He's from Great Britain. He's the prime minister of Great Britain at the time. I call him the Punisher. Because what Lloyd George wants to see happen is he wants to see Germany punished for what happened during World War I. He demands that Germany repay Britain for the cost of the war and for the lives lost and that Germany be punished for what he sees as their role in being the ones who started the war and who are going to make the war such a vicious, long ordeal. So he wants to punish Germany. That's his goal. And the third is the leader of France at the time, George Clemenceau. George Clemenceau is the French prime minister. I call him the crippler because what George Clemenceau wants to do in his goal is to cripple the ability of Germany 
or other countries to ever be able to attack France again. Twice in George Clemenceau's lifetime, he has seen his country of France invaded by the German military. Once in the 1870s during the unification of Germany and a war between what's called the Franco-Prussian War between the German states and France, and then once again in 1914 at the beginning of World War I. So George Clemenceau says we're going to cripple their ability to ever wage war. Now, if you note, these two guys here, Lloyd George and George Clemenceau, both have goals that are going to be targeting Germany, and both feel Germany is the ones that are responsible for the entire war. But if we think back to the notes I did on day one, the causes of the war, it's pretty obvious that Germany was only one player in what caused the war. They were not the only country who was militaristic or that were part of the alliance systems, or that were an imperial power, or that was nationalistic, M-A-I-N, the main causes, nor were they even involved in any way whatsoever in the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, which sparks the war itself. So, you know, the, the, the German people are going to be very frustrated immediately by the fact that they're not represented at this meeting. So the Allied goals, just to kind of recap that, right, Germany becomes the target during the peace settlement. Britain wants to punish Germany for the war. France wants to cripple Germany's ability to um, essentially be able to wage war ever again. And the United States favored what was known as a lasting peace. So when the treaty is eventually negotiated, it takes quite some time to get worked out, months and months of negotiation between the, the allies, again, with no representation of the central powers, who, mind you, again, did not surrender. They signed an armistice with the allies. When they finally come up with this treaty in which, you know, everyone gets a little bit of what they want, but not everything that they want, Germany does not want to sign it, okay? Germany does not want to agree to this. The leaders of Germany, a new government that is put in place after World War I in Germany, has no intention of signing this. However, they are going to essentially be forced into doing so or bullied into doing so by what you can see in this headline of this newspaper here, by blockading off the capital of Germany, Berlin. Essentially what happens is the Allies use their military forces to block off Berlin from any, any resources, food, supplies going in or out of Berlin and essentially say we are not going to allow that to happen until you agree to sign this agreement. So the German government at the time finally caves and is going to sign the peace agreement known as the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. And when we start to look at the terms of the treaty, there's a lot of different parts of it, but there's six or seven really important components of it that are going to be factors that shape the rise of the Nazi party in Germany and that are going to factor into the rise of Adolf Hitler and ultimately the start of World War I. So we need to know some of them pretty well in order to understand the story of world history. So what I've done is I've come up with another acronym. I use MAIN, M-A-I-N, to talk about the causes. Now, this is a random word. But I use the word gargle, G-A-R-G-L-E, to help remember the terms of the treaty. And I, I've never been able to come up with a better way to rearrange these letters that makes more sense. You know, a good way for me to remember it is, you know, Germany hated this agreement. And, you know, when you have a bad taste in your mouth, you want to gargle mouthwash to get that taste out of your mouth. Germany had a bad taste in its mouth from this treaty. Therefore, they wanted to gargle it out. So here's what these letters stand for. Each of these letters stands for one of the six major parts of the Treaty of Versailles that are going to be affecting the future history. So the first G stands for guilt. The German government is forced to sign a statement accepting the blame for starting the war. It's called the guilt clause. And this is going to be a huge factor that Adolf Hitler, particularly in the Nazis, are going to capitalize on using propaganda to say, you know, we were not guilty and the weak German government at the time, agreed to accept guilt. So Germany's forced to say it was our fault. Everything that happened during the war, all the people who died, all the cost of the war, all the devastation and destruction of the land, that is all our fault. And again, we think back about the causes of the war, that does not seem very accurate anymore. So the first G in gargle is guilt. The A stands for armed forces. Germany was forced to agree to having its military reduced to a bare bones, you know, hardly anything just enough to protect itself type military. What that means is they signed agreeing that they would have no more submarines or what the Germans called U-boats, Untersee boats. They could have no airplanes or air force. They could only have six battleships. They could only have 100,000 men maximum in the military. And they could have no drafts ensuring that they cannot bring men into the military. 
There was also a clause under the armed forces part that said there could be no military, German military in the area known as the Rhineland. This is the area of Germany that butts up against France and Belgium. And the idea of this was, if they could not have a military there, Germany could never invade France again. Again, that's part of George Clemenceau's goal, right? He was the crippler. He wanted to cripple Germany's ability to wage war or invade France ever again. So guilt, armed forces, the R in gargle up here, stands for reparations. Reparations was essentially the fact that because Germany accepted guilt for the war, they agreed to repay huge amounts of money to the allied countries for the damages that they caused. And the number that was settled on at the time was 269 billion German marks, or what were called Deutschmarks at the time. That would be the equivalent of $834 billion in the United States today. And in fact, this takes so long that the German government does not finally repay the last part of the reparations payments until 2010, just 10 years ago. And the war ended 101 years ago, 102 years ago, technically, but the treaty was signed 101 years ago. Okay, so it took them 90 years to, to repay all those reparations. So guilt, armed forces, reparations. The second G stood for German territory. So a lot of the land that Germany had acquired throughout the age of imperialism and the era leading up to this part was taken away. They lost direct territory around its borders. The colonies that they had established during the age of imperialism were given to the allies. And this German territory is going to become part of different countries after World War I. And one of the most important factors that allows Adolf Hitler and the Nazis to catapult themselves into power in Germany is using this notion that German people belong under the German government. And because of the Treaty of Versailles, many German people no longer lived in Germany. They lived in Poland or they were in Czechoslovakia or these other countries that were created or expanded when German territory was taken after World War I. And this is going to be a huge factor in how the Nazis are able to begin their campaign of, you know, taking over land across Europe and how it's justified and allowed to happen in the beginning. So the GAR, guilt, armed forces, reparation payments, German territory taken away. The L stood for the League of Nations. That was the idea that was created at the insistence of the U.S. President uh, Woodrow Wilson. Remember, he had 14 points he wanted to see take place when he arrives in Paris. Only one of them, the most important though for him, the League of Nations, is the one that is established. And basically what the League of Nations is, it's this international forum that's going to help settle disputes between countries and keep the peace before it erupts into war. The problem with the League of Nations is, as we'll learn in the 1930s, it is proven to be extremely weak with no teeth, meaning it doesn't have the ability to actually do anything to stop people like Mussolini or Hitler or Japan as they begin violating the terms of the League of Nations. In fact, one of the reasons they're going to be weak is, even though this is the President of the United States' baby, it's his most important idea, the League of Nations, the United States is one of only a couple of countries that never joins. Because when Woodrow Wilson returns home to the U.S. at the end of this Paris Peace Conference, and he's talking about this Treaty of Versailles, and he says, we got the League of Nations, don't worry, there will never be another international conflict again, because we have this peace agreement, and we've established this international body. The United States Senate blocks the United States from joining the League of Nations because they believe that joining this international body is much like what happened with the alliances in that it's going to cause the U.S. to get dragged into a foreign war that is not their problem. So the United States never joins the League of Nations. So that's the G-A-R-G-L in Gargle. And the E, and again, this map just shows here how you know all the countries of the world, except for the ones that are this purple color, like the United States, never become part of the, the League of Nations. The U.S., Saudi Arabia, um, you know, Mongolia, there's a very few countries that don't join. Other ones join at very, very different times. And then finally, whoops, I don't know what that was. Where'd my stuff go here? Oop, let me get back up here. Where did we go? How did that happen? Okay, finally, the E, the end of gargle, stands for extra points. I mean, the treaty had hundreds of different provisions and points in it, but a few extra points that are notable because they factor into World War II. One was that it forbid, the treaty forbid a union or an alliance between Germany and Austria ever allowed again. 
called the Anschluss, an alliance between them. Therefore, Germany and Austria are told they cannot have an alliance ever again, and that's going to be violated by Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. Italy is going to be not be given land it was promised for becoming an ally. If we remember Italy at the beginning of the war, they were actually in a treaty with Germany and the Ottoman Empire, but they switched sides under the promise that they would be given territory if they helped the Allies. They're not given that. That's what's going to cause Italy to have this rise of fascism and Benito Mussolini and going to become an ally of Germany in the years after World War I. And then third, there was a German colony in China that was not given to Japan. It was supposed to be given to Japan, but it was not. Therefore, Japan, during its imperial ambitions of the 1920s and 30s, is going to again side with Italy and Germany, thus making up the three parts of the Axis powers that the Allies are going to fight in World War II. So the treaty overall, Germany is going to lose a bunch of stuff. 10% of its territory was taken away. All of its colonies are gone. 12% of its population no longer lives in Germany because it got given to other countries. All of its air force is gone. Most of its army and navy and much of its steel industry and its ability to continue to industrialize was taken away from it as well. So, you know, the territory Germany loses, if we kind of look at a map here of Northern Europe, all these areas in pink and peach and different colors, these were all part of Germany prior to the war. But they lose all these different areas here, the Danzig Corridor. They lose down here the Sudetenland. The Rhineland becomes a demilitarized zone. And essentially, all of these areas are the areas that Adolf Hitler is going to insist on having back in the 1930s, which is ultimately going to be what leads to World War II. So there's a few other peace settlements as well. That's the Treaty of Versailles. That was a specific treaty with Germany. Now, there was also a treaty with Austria-Hungary that broke it up into two new countries of um, uh, Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia are formed in the Balkan region. The Ottoman Empire is dismantled and they become what are called protectorates of the Allies. Uh, out of them, the, uh, the country of Turkey is formed though. The rest of it, the part of the Middle East, become what are known as mandates, meaning they were governed over by the Allies. So basically the map of Europe is redrawn. Here's Europe before 1919. Germany and Austria and Hungarian Empire have a huge control area of Central Europe. But after 1919, after these treaties, you know, you have the expansion of Poland, the creation of Czechoslovakia, Austria and Hungary become separate countries, a whole area of Yugoslavia is created, Romania is growing, Bulgaria shrinks in size. So this agreement at the end of World War I does reshape the map of Europe. Yep. And again, just to look at it one more time here, you can see all these different um, regions that are going to be new borders. So everywhere in which you see these red lines, this is where new borders are going to be redrawn after World War I, which really does show us just how much the map is going to change. Okay? So that's how World War I comes to a conclusion, and we will focus next week, or in two weeks, I guess, after midterms, on how these changes are going to give rise to the fascist leaders in Germany and Italy, as well as the expansionist policies of Japan, which ultimately take us to World War II.